Thank you very much, Dr. Guglielmi. It's a pleasure for me to speak in this, what I believe, without rhetoric, is an historic conference. I've been asked to provide a framework for uh, the impact of personalized medicine in national health system. And as we have been discussing in these one and a half days, we are uh, facing complex challenges, but we are also living, for me, some of the most interesting uh, time of ever the, East, the human history. And of course, these challenges are uh, the ones that uh, uh, are characterized by rising demand, increasing costs, and insufficient funding. And innovation is a key feature that we cannot lose the opportunity to have. But personalized medicine is not an ordinary innovation, is not a sustaining innovation, is a disruptive innovation. So it's an innovation that creates a new market or expands an existing market by applying a different set of values, which ultimately and unexpectedly sometimes overtakes an existing market. And this was a major concern for all the member states, but also for the European Commission. As a panel, as an expert panel of, on effective ways of investing in that, actually, we have been asked to provide an opinion on how disruptive innovation can affect health and healthcare in Europe. I had the privilege to be the rapporteur of this opinion. And we, may, we gave, first of all, a definition, which is a European definition. It's different from what was coined and developed in the past 10 years in the United States. Uh, there was the seminal work by Clayton Christensen about the innovator prescriptions. Essentially, in that part of the world, an innovation is technology, and then the market uh, uh, gets it. So in, in Europe, we have a different history, we have a different culture, we have different values. So our definition is that disruptive innovation is a type of innovation that creates new networks and new organizations based on a new set of values involving new players, which makes it possible to help improve outcomes and other valuable goals, such as equity, a value which is peculiar to our history and efficiency. This innovation displaces older system and ways of doing things. The main characteristic of disruptive innovation, and actually personalized medicine at the, as the mall, is to provide improved outcomes, create new services and overcome challenges regarding accessibility to existing or new services, leading to cost-effective methodology that improve access, promote person-centered health delivery, empowering the patient and person, creating new professional roles and capacities, creating a new sets of values for the health workforce, for patients, for citizens, for the community, introduce transformative cultural change and disorder all systems. And we identified, actually, personalized medicine is one of them, for the future of Europe, five strategic areas in, we, in which we have to focus our effort to work together. Translational research, health promotion, professional education, personalized medicine, and technology. And this is a substantially different approach from what has been developed in the United States. Also, we have analyzed the barriers to disruptive innovation. When you uh, start to do that, uh, you may have some workforce barriers. You may have some oppositions, reluctance to change, cultural barriers. We have mentioned many times the word silos. There are silos of different types. You can have patient person's barriers, again, cultural, but also the health literacy or mobility support. You can have organizational, institutional barriers, inadequate ne network and processes because there is a lack of realistic business models, the procurement process doesn't work, there is a lack of adequate technical analysis and planning and so forth. You can have economic and legal barriers and you have to invest to overcome that. You can have lack of political support. This is not the case for uh, personalized medicine up so far, but there are cases in which effective, equitable, efficient, human, disruptive innovation are not seen as a priority by politicians. And uh, last but not least, you can have a lack of evaluation, lack of ex-ante monitoring and exposed evaluation techniques, tools and methodologies. And after all, we, I mean, in the previous session, the, the word value was used. And in an era in which resources often do not increase, and I will show that in some kinds decrease, uh, with uh, in increasing needs and demand, when they increase at all, it is essential to promote that disruptive innovation are, uh, uh, present high value. And in my opinion, the ones that are going to be funded by public bodies are the innovation that have the triple value for the patient, for the person, for the professional, and for the payers. In the policy issues, of course, you, you must have 
a very careful approach to implementation. You must address all the aspects, and this is the framework in which Europe should move. And all the stakeholders, but in particular policymakers, should analyze how to enhance the enablers and how to address the already identified possible barriers. And when identified the areas of introduction of personalized medicine, it is necessary to take into consideration the aspects regarding its projected impacts, the context, and the feasibility. It's very interesting to look how Americans look at uh, the world because I think that the decades of dynamic change that they have witnessed they are common to, to our continent. I mean, there have been revolutionary changes in information technology, changes in citizen expectations, changes in patient expectation, changes in payment system, changes in provider configuration. We share these challenges all with the states. But what we have as an additional challenge is the combination of factors, the combination of waves of demand and supply can lead our continent to a perfect storm. What is a perfect storm? A perfect storm is an expression that describes an event where a rare combination of circumstances will aggravate a situation drastically. In other words, you can put under control each of the situation and you maybe even in, 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 in a situation, in a storm like this, you can uh, save your crew, you can save your ship. But when there is a combination that happens to occur in such a confluence resulting in an event of unusual magnitude, I mean, the, the result can be very, very bad. And what are the waves of demand and supply that are peculiar to Europe? Of course, the demographic and epidemiological transition. Of course, the increasing of population needs and demand. Of course, the professional differentiation. Of course, the technical innovation. And you don't need to be a demographer to understand that how our demographic structure in most of Western countries has so dramatically changed that it's not sustainable from any point of view. This was the main structure of Western countries' demography in the 70s. Nowadays, for instance, in Italy, Germany, France, the maybe France less, the situation is like this. You don't need to be a scientist to understand that this is not sustainable. You don't need to be an epidemiologist or a doctor in order to understand the explosions of chronic disease and the comorbidity. For the first time in the history of medicine, we are 85-year-old patients with six different diseases taking eight medications, and that medication has not been proved or evaluated for that kind of approach. And this is an explosion of combination. Older people uh, not able to take care because of the combination of numbers and costs are frightening. And of course, I mean, in the perfect world, we could have an increasing in, co in, in expenditures. That's not the case, at least for some countries in Europe, because after the disaster of the banking and financial failure, which was originated in a, in a sector which was outside the health sector, what is happening in some European countries, and that actually is the money that is going to the health sector, is not increasing at all, rather is dropping. And you see a certain list of important countries on the left part of this graph where the budget are decreasing rather than increasing. So in other words, the European social model is at risk was a model that made our history and our continent one of the most successful story in the world. It was a system of transfer from rich to poor, from young to old, from employed to unemployed, from healthy to ill. And when this model is going to fail, and when we are not going to have a European social model, there will be winners and losers, there will be people who are dying and people who survived. But of course, we don't want that. That's why the, the, the word health sustainability is at core of discussion in, in, many, in many tables and, of course, also in these tables of the European Union. But it's not a problem that we have to approach only in the framework of financial, because this is not a, a, a small problem. Small problems, as Will Roberts says, uh, you, you can solve with money. This is something that you must solve and can solve also with thinking a new solution. I had the honor and the privilege to serve as rapporteur of the European uh, White Paper on Sustainability in a group chaired by the Honorable uh, Former Minister of Health and Deputy Prime Minister of Ireland, Mary Herney, who is going to moderate and chair the next session. And we said 
that, uh, again, we are going to build the plane while we are flying, exactly like that, but we cannot afford not to invest in the same time in prevention and early intervention, in empowering and responsible, creating responsible citizens and the reorganization of care. And in the organization of care, I believe that we are facing a similar challenge that we are faced in the genomic testing, in genetic testing and genomics. I was part of this group that debated in Cambridge for a couple of years, and our conclusion, I, I mean, substitute simply the word public health genomics with personalized medicine, and you can say that the major challenge for personalized medicine is to generate an evidence base to demonstrate when use of personalized medicine information in public health can improve health outcomes in a safe, effective, and cost-effective manner. And the implementation of evidence-based genomics personalized medicine application could and should maximize health benefits and reduce disparities, reduce harms and unnecessary health care expenditures from premature and or inappropriate use of the disease information, provide a means of evaluating and so forth. I mean, the challenges are the same. And in the framework of the financial contest, as I said, we have an additional challenge. Who is going to pay for this? How much will the expanded use of personalized medicine further escalate the cost of all health care? And who will pay for that? Uh, overly enthusiastic expectation regarding the benefits of personalized medicine have the potential to distort research priority and spending for health. In this area of increasing concern about health costs, it will be impossible to consider the implication of personalized medicine without considering the economic implication. And we have already other additional challenges in Europe. I mean, I've listed some of them. I'm not pretending to be exhaustive, but still the economies, most of the economies are still stalled six years after 2008. The revenue consequences for a sector I showed, and there are already some problems in some important countries. Take UK. For the first time since 1948, a major strike from junior doctors, English GP, BMA, may be joining them. The Finnish labor unions required to work 72 hours more per year with the same salary. The French unions rejecting Holland's labor market restructuring forms. The request of additional financial responsibility for patient and commission and family responsibility in the Netherlands. And we have additional, how can I call, geopolitical challenges because the United States, God bless us if the presidential race go in a certain way, certainly will ask us to have certain higher military expenditures. What about Brexit and the implication? What about China's slowdown? What about the negative interest rate? What about the increasing challenge and debate about centralization? In my country, we are going to have a referendum in October concerning a recentralized responsibility for health. Hopefully, we will win, or increasing decentralization. And what about the challenge of migration of hundreds of thousands of people pushing at our barrier? We should create a perfect healthcare system to solve all these challenges. But the perfect healthcare system <clears throat> does not exist in any one country in the world because it depends on cultural values and expectation. What is perfect in a country may not be in another country. And it's less easy to describe than the long list of challenges and shortcomings. I've made an exercise with the help of Jenny Simpson and Mark Bricknell that said if we could start from scratch with an empty sheet of paper, the fair system might look like the values of universal health care as in Italy and the UK, the health promotion as in the Nordic countries, the funding levels of Switzerland, the patient choice as in French and Germany, the excellent innovative primary care as in Israel, the fabulous mental health and approach to well-being as in Australia, the patient and community empowerment copied from Nigeria and Kenya, the brilliant approach to care for the aging population as in Japan, the state-of-the-art communication information flows and technology as found in Singapore, and the research and development of the U.S. and innovative thinking in India. But the reality of healthcare means that we do not have the luxury of blank sheets of paper or plentiful resources, downtime to stop doing what we do, think about it and start doing something different, even because we don't have a total freedom from political and economic drive interference. That's why I believe that PERMED, has been said since the very beginning of the conference, must fo focus on the two that we already have, share the European experience, made core HTA at European level, and then adapting to local level, because of course culture values are local. I believe that this is possible, I believe that this is something that PERMED can do. Finally, we have to be aware that innovation creates winners and losers, and the losers will be resistance. And for this reason, it is important to involve the health professions. The patients are already on board. Paradoxically, sometimes 
uh, the health professional is resistant to change, and we have to be working with that since the beginning. The sooner the better in order to understand that this is not a threat, this is an historical challenge. In conclusion, disruptive innovation as personalized medicine can be a very important instrument in European policies can provide a new and different perspective that tends to reduce complexity in favor of the empowerment of the citizen and patient, should be seen by policymakers as possible new methods of dealing with all issues. And health systems, and this is, I hope, an insight in the future, should be responsive to innovations and allow promising disruptive innovation to be tested, evaluated, and implementing. And this requires the presence of responsive and open-minded systems, or maybe, as has been said in the previous sessions, an ecosystem. We all face the same challenges, but I am fairly optimistic because if we were to share our strengths, and undoubtedly in Europe we have many strengths, we would be better able to meet the demands of future generations. And I think this is the maximal aspiration that a decision maker, a scientist, a politician, a citizen can have in these challenging but exciting times. Thank you very much for your attention.